Evening everyone, welcome back to Nerds in the North. Time for another Wheel of Time video. Specifically in topic today, The Great Hunt, book two in the franchise. This one starts off in a very, very intriguing way. Uh, with the prologue, we have a meeting of just about a hundred dark friends. And we hear it all from the eyes of someone who's called Bors. Now that's the fake name that the author has given him. Or that the character has given himself so that he can completely disguise who he is during this meeting. Which is actually quite a brilliant idea, because you don't want anybody finding out that you're a dark friend, especially one that's actually been summoned before uh, the very image of Baalzamon. I like how it's described when this starts off. Uh, you, s you start to recognize, actually, if, once you've gone through the entirety of the series, you start to recognize just who some of these people are. Um, the Tinker, for instance, I, I kind of recognize who he is. Uh, obviously, there's a couple of the sisters that you see there. Uh, the Shinarin is a major one and actually comes back into play in this book. So that was a good one to see and you don't really catch it right away. It's, there's subtle hints thrown in, and that's probably one of the best things about the Wheel of Time, is characters get subtle hints, subtle mentions, and until they actually come into fruition, you didn't know exactly what was going to be going on. So we have the book start off, after this prologue, the Amerlin seat herself has shown up at Tarvalon, and this is exactly one of the reasons why I say hold off on New Spring. You don't want to be reading New Spring until at least after this book. Uh, because this book reveals a lot about Moraine and Suan Sanche. And if you already know about that from New Spring, it's really kind of spoiled by the time you get to this. But the Amerlin shows up, she meets with um, Moraine, she actually has an audience with Randall Thor. I love how Lan teaches him the old form just to kind of piss off the Amerlin seat. Uh, we then have the party splitting off because the Horn of Valir and the dagger from Shadar Logoth have been stolen. And we have Rand, Matt, Perrin and Loyal heading off with Ingtar, Uno, and, um, what's his name? The, the Sniffer. Anyway, the Sniffer's name, the Sniffer character. I'll uh, come up with his name eventually. It always seems to happen. But they take off to go and find after, um, chase after the group who had stolen the Horn of Valir because the Sniffer can smell the evil that they that they cause, that they create. Just because Dark Friends and Trollocs and Murdral, they leave the stink behind. Uh, then we have Egwene and Nynaeve heading off with the Amerlin's crew heading for Tower Valen. This is where we start to figure out just how powerful Nynaeve can be. Uh, she f imprisons the Amerlin in air before the Amerlin shields her. Uh, we find out then as they get to the tower that... Nynaeve is not meant for the novice books. She's jumping straight to the accepted, which is quite incredible. And we get, of course, to meet Elaine. Uh, we run into Min again, and this whole bunch of fun that happens there in the White Tower as they're learning, as they're experiencing what the White Tower is like. And then we come across one of the Black Sisters. Uh, I don't assume that this was one of the sisters in Shadar Logoth when uh, they had the meeting in the prologue. But they come across Leandrin, and Leandrin steals them away and basically sells them into servitude to the Shan Chan. And this is a huge, pivotal moment for the character of Egwene. Because what happens to her is not something I would wish to happen to anybody, and it really does forge her character throughout the rest of the series. While all this is going on, 
um, Matt and Perrin are heading off with Ingtar, and for s somewhere out of the blue, Rand, uh, Loyal, and the Sniffer, whose name is Huron, told you I'd remember it, they have taken off randomly. They've vanished out of a campsite, and they're in this world between worlds. Uh, actually is because Rand used a portal stone in his sleep. I don't know if I really want to have the ability to use the power if I'm going to be channeling in my sleep, right? Uh, at this point, we come across the Lady Selene, and the four of them get back out of a portal stone, and they're right near uh, Karian, and Rand is forced to deal with the Game of Houses, which is really interesting and diabolical at the same time, how the Karian and use the Game of Houses really adds a lot of intrigue in the book, um, just exactly with how things are going on. Uh, while they are locked off in Karian, we have Perrin and Matt. Perrin, who is using the wolves to help track the Dark Friends and saying that he's a sniffer like Huron, is trying to keep them all on the same path. However, with... Um, they're still always, they always seem to be a little bit further ahead, but the Dark Friends, you know, Trollocs run really, really pretty quickly. Especially when they have Padon Fane with them, and this is when Padon Fane really starts to shift. Uh, he starts becoming less Padon Fane and more Moradin, or Mordith, sorry, Ordith, Ordith. Because he's really sick and twisted, and once he gets the dagger, I mean, he staples a merge roll to the wall and kills it this way, and it's brutal. Just brutal how Padon Fane deals with things. So they're taking off. They've left note that, um, you know, I have the horn, I have the dagger. If you want them back, you come to come and find me on Tarman Head. Or... Tarman Head? Almoth Plain. Anyways. So that's the direction that everybody's heading in. Uh, Rand and Huron and Loyal uh, come across an old familiar face. Emphemous on the old. They come across Tom Marilyn once again. That's a shocker. That's a big shocker. Uh, almost as big of a shocker as, you know... You get a very subtle hint at uh, the character of um, crap. The uh, il the Illuminator. I uh, can't remember what her name is. Anyways, she becomes very very important later on, and she actually gets uh, blamed for an incident of the Trollocs outside Carrion setting off and destroying the Chapter House, because the Trollocs were chasing Rand and Loyal and Huron. And they hid in the chapter house, and stuff happened. The chapter house exploded with fireworks. Impromptu show. Yay! The character's name is Aludra. Aludra is the, in charge of that chapter house there. And you will definitely be hearing more and more about Aludra as the series goes on. She actually becomes quite pivotal with one of her designs later on. Now, what else do I remember? We get introduced to the Shan Chen. Uh, the Shan Chen are, as everyone knows, um, the people. Uh, the people have sailed across the Aerith Ocean and have returned from Arthur Hawkwing's empire, or Tur Hawkwing, uh, Arthur. So they are Hawkwing's blood returned to the land. They believe that they own it. That these people should kneel. Bef that everybody here should kneel before them, and they start quelling rebellion, squashing everything with a ruthless hand, but at the same time, they're not necessarily a bad thing for the area, because they don't leave unrest where they are. They actually tend to solve a lot of problems, at least in the later novels they do. But right now, the problem is, is they have their hands on Egwene, and the Shan Chan treat Aes Sedai as, or anybody who can channel the One Power, as 
tools that have to be harnessed to be used. Imagine a collar being placed around your neck. A collar that you could not touch if you thought of taking it off because you'll become violently ill. A collar that, to mock you, wherever your handler leaves the edge of her, the end of the collar, that's or the end of the wristband that's attached to the leash, which is attached to your collar, you can't touch it, you can't move it, you can't make it budge without becoming violently ill or locking up in pain. You can't think of harming them. You are completely and utterly a slave. And you become... The worst part about it is the degradation of... You start feeling sorry that you haven't served your master well enough. So it really does start to break you down. And Egwene being as powerful as she is... You know, that, that's a prime catch for them. They're not letting her go anywhere. By this point in time, everybody has shown up down on Almuth Plain, and everybody, all the storylines are starting to intertwine there. Min and Nynaeve and Elaine are down there trying to free Egwene. Uh, Matt and Rand and Perrin are all down there as well, trying to get the Horn of Valir back, trying to get the dagger back. Which the Rand and Perrin, or Rand and Ma, bleh, Rand and Loyal, sorry, did have their hands on the horn and the dagger for quite some time until Padon Fane came and claimed it back, and took off, and that's when the the two groups kind of met and continued on. Now, they continued on in a rough way because in order to try and catch up to them and save time, Rand decided to use a portal stone again. And rather than saving time, they cost them about six weeks. So there's a lot of time that is gapped open in this trying to travel through the portal stone directly. They make their way into the city of Falma. They go and try and steal the horn back. And lo and behold, the Shan Shen have it. Not just the Shan Shen, but the... Uh, High commander of the Shan Shan at this point, one of the members of the Blood, uh, Turok. And upon seeing Rand, the one thing that Rand feared from the very beginning of this book is not knowing how to use his sword, because the mark of the Heron means Blade Master, and he has a Heron Mark Blade, but he doesn't necessarily know exactly how well to use it. While Turok also has a Heron Mark blade, and is a full blade master, so he is left to duel with Rand. And to Rand's benefit, he does win. Barely, but he does win. So he has earned now this full right to become a blade master, because you are either told by a blade master that you are a blade master, or you defeat a blade master in one-on-one -on -one combat to become a blade master. And he clearly defeated Turak. While this, Egwene and, um, has been allowed to escape from uh, her servitude, from the help of Nynaeve and Elaine. And they discover something insanely damaging to the Shan Chan. Very damaging. Shan Chan want all women who can touch the One Power leashed. However, the Suldam that they use to leash them, because not every woman can be a Suldam either. The Suldam who can who wield the leashes, who wield the leashed ones, can learn to channel. Damani have the spark born in them. The Suldam can be taught how to channel. Because this is found out in a very, very intriguing way. They put the collar on to one of the Suldam, and it works. If you put this collar on someone who cannot access the One Power in any way, shape, or form, the collar will do nothing. You can't stop them. They know the One Power. If, they, if the One Power will be theirs at any point, it will control them. And that will break the Shan Shan Empire, because that is themselves what it is built upon. This comes back later on in, I believe, Book 13, with a confrontation between... No, 14, sorry. Confrontation between uh, Egwene and Fortuona. 
I'll talk about that when I actually get to that point, because I don't want to spoil it. So, where else have we left off here? Oh, probably one of the greatest things that happens in this book. They hit, they get the horn, they're on their way out, and at this point, Ingtar reveals that he is a dark friend. He was the Shinaran in the beginning prologue. And he chased after the horn in vain hope that it would help him return to the light, because he doesn't want to do this anymore. Being so close to the three Tavirn has twisted him away from the Dark One's control. Barely. Enough so that Ingtar goes and fights to his death to allow the horn to get away to safety. That's a pretty intense moment, because it's not something that you see coming right away. Uh, it does explain just why Ingtar is so furious and desperate to get the horn back, but it's not something that you really see coming automatically. As they race out of the city, Rand realizes, crap, the power is going off in there, Egwene is trapped in there, I have to get Egwene back, because he saw her on his way through. Rand and Matt are with him, along with Hur, and they spin around, they're ready to ride back. But at that point, they see the entire Shan Shen army has left the city and has formed up on the road. On the plains, on Almuth Plain, sorry. They have formed up there, and across the field from there is an entire legion of the White Cloaks, led by um, Lord Commander Bornholt. Uh, can't remember what his first name is, but, uh, the character of Jane Bornhold, uh, that, or Dane, Dane Bornhold is, uh, the son of this man, and this is also where Bayer is. Bayer sees this happen, Bayer is the one that reports it back to Dane, and to Lord, Lord, uh, Lord Captain Commander of the White Cloaks himself. So the White Cloaks and the Shan Shen clash... And Rand is still freaking out. He's got to get back there. He's got to save the, um, got to save Elaine, or got to save Egwene. Rand and Matt agree that you've got to go and do this, and you're not going to be doing this by yourself. At which point, Matt, who has got the horn of Valir around his pommel, just decides, well, you know what? Horn needs to be there for the last battle. Nothing says it can't be used beforehand, and he sounds the Horn of Valir, which summons forth the heroes of legend, Arthur Hawkwing and the Hundred Companions. They show up, they recognize Rand as who he is, speaking to him as though he were Louis Theron Telemann. And they stand there and they're like, oh, something holds us. The Horn Sounder is here, the dragon is here. But we cannot move. The banner. Do you have the banner? And Rand does. It's actually in his pack bags. And Moraine put it there. And he's like, well, I do, but I'm not the dragon. And I don't want to be. And just, he's fighting it the entire time. And Perrin jumps off of his horse. Walks over to a tree with his mighty axe. Fells this branch. Cleans off the edges. And comes back with this long pole and looks up at Rand. He's like, give it to me. What? Give me the banner, Rand. If they need it, we're going to do this. So there you go. The three Tavirin together. Even Huron suits up ready to ride in. And the uh, the heroes of legend are just, oh, well, you know, every now and then, the pattern does add to our number. Perhaps you'll join us one day, brave man. Because, you know, all he's got is a sword breaker and a club. And he takes off into battle. And it's just great seeing these hundred heroes of legend riding through the fog. Heading to the battle to spearhead in through the Shan Chen. Drive the Shan Chen back into the ocean. While this is going on, Baal Zaman appears. And challenges Randall Thor to battle. So Randall Thor, furious at the fact that he had not defeated the Dark One, seeks to take him down again. And with each play they move, as Rand gets pushed back, the Shan Chan push back the forces of light. As the as Rand pushes forward, the Shan Chan get pushed back. It's this constant push and pull and drag. 
It's an amazing scene to be described, and at this point, Rand decides there's only one way to win this. He must sheathe the sword. So he lets Baalzaman get close. He lets Baalzaman strike him, run him through with the staff that he was wearing. Now, a staff put ramming you through the ribcage. Ow! That's going to leave quite the big hole. Especially one that's searing with this darkness, this dark fire. But Baalzaman's gotten in close, and Rand turns and drives the heron mark blade of his father straight into Baalzaman, killing him. Ending Baalzaman once and for all. Now, this is a battle that you think is happening just between the two of them, but no, this battle is being projected across the sky. Thousands upon thousands see the dragon fighting the Dark One in the sky, which is what they all believe it was that they were seeing. Rand, mortally wounded, falls back down to the ground to be found by Min who we discover at this point, Min is madly in love with him. It's one of her viewings that she will fall to love this man. And as Min is keeping him safe, trying to keep him alive, Egwene sees this, and Egwene's able to let go, because the two of them were supposed to be betrothed to each other. But Egwene lets go. You're in good hands. At this point, the Lady Selene shows up, and glares at Min. He's like, I think I'll allow you to keep him safe for me until I need him. You will keep him safe for me, but he is mine, girl. Don't you forget it. When he awakes, let him know that Lanfear is waiting for him. So the Lady Selene was the forsaken Lanfear all along. This is a jaw-dropping moment when I first read it uh, blew my mind. I did not know that Lady Selene was going to be the Forsaken. Reading back through it now, it even doesn't make sense. Like, it wasn't given away. It wasn't even hinted at. Until you actually find out how Lanfear is dressed, how Lanfear likes to reveal herself, you don't know that it's her until you actually then see what Selene is described as and go, oh, okay, now I can put two and two together. But you can't put two and two together unless you've already made it into book six. So, absolutely brilliant story. Uh, we get to meet another new character. We get to meet uh, Bael Doman, and he will become relatively important. Uh, I believe we actually do get to meet... Um, a character, uh, I can't remember her real name, because her name changes numerous times. It's a member of the Shan Chen, uh, one of the Shan Chen generals. Uh, ends up helping the... Um, is it helping? No, that's, that's in a later book. Never mind. Never mind. But we do end up meeting, uh, Del... meeting, um... The ship trader, and he becomes again. He becomes important later on. But this book, this book is one of those that leaves you as soon as it ends. You're like, <gasps> more! I want more. As soon as this book ends, you're gonna want more. You're gonna want to pick up the next one. So I highly highly recommend. If you have the audiobooks ready to go, make sure that you have both of them on your listening device of choice at that time. If not, if you find that you're getting in close to the very end of The Great Hunt, you better have the Dragon Reborn on hand because you're going to want to start right away. Right away. Because this is when the story starts to pick up. And Eye of the World might have been slow to start, but Great Hunt and Dragon Reborn... This is where it starts getting good. This is when everything starts to weave together. The pattern starts showing its age lace. And, oh, so much of this is memorable in my mind. Again, as I said, I have no notes down here in front of me. This is all that I remember from the story. I apologize if I have some plot scenes slightly out of order. 
but this is the, as much of the memorable moments and everything that I can remember for you to tell you. And if you haven't wanted to read one of these books, if you keep watching these videos, while some things might get spoiled for you, you'll enjoy them no matter what. I can't say enough to ruin them. You will enjoy going through these books, especially if you're going through the audio books, if you are an audio learner like me, because it's going to be watching a movie behind your eyes. Absolutely outstanding. Cannot recommend them enough. We'll see you guys again uh, later on this week when I record my thoughts and feelings and recollections for book three of The Wheel of Time, The Dragon Reborn. Until then, I'll leave you guys with book two. Take care. And may the light ever guide you.